What's up, what's up, what's up, IG? Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Let's see how many are on tonight. What's going on, Clinicia? What's going on, Brother Ernest? Uh, what's going on, Celebrity? Yonder, Yondman? I'm not reading quickly or fast enough. There's Pastor Don Ramirez. How you doing, sir? Sincerely, Chelsea. Faithfully yours. Miss Kena Lene, Whitney, how are y'all doing? Kay Carter, I am jumping on tonight. Listen, faithfully yours, how are you, sis? Uh, what's going on, Roxanne, Brittany, Tina, Damien? Listen, I am hopping on tonight. I did not go live on Sunday. We have had a busy, busy week. Hey, Kersian, for those of you who are new, and we'll give people a little time to get on, I normally do what's called Sunday night check-in. And in this summer, kind of this last month, I've kind of done them on a Tuesday or I've done them on a Wednesday. Um, but the goal is to check in every week. Hey, Kershaw, my brother, how are you today? Hey, uh, Marissa, blessings, ooh, beauty. Um, and so there's my younger cousin, Crystal. I think I may fall into the auntie category with her, even though she is technically a cousin. Uh, but yeah, I'm hopping on tonight because I did not get on this past Sunday and I'm not sure that I'm going to make it on this this coming Sunday. And so I was like, I know it's late. Hey, Monique, um, but I might as well jump on. A lot has happened since we have all been on here together. And so um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to mispronounce your name. Um that said I was wonderful on Wednesday. Hey, Ramicia, the boss wife, 95. But a lot has happened since we spoke. Um, as we have some new people here, we have some new um, followers this week since Wednesday night. Uh, and so I want to welcome them, welcome them here. And just let them know that this is something we started doing during the pandemic is checking in and making sure you're okay. Giving me your life updates. I give you my life updates. Um, since we have talked last, a lot has happened. I was in Columbus, Ohio all last week for our, our Holy Convocation, which is the organization uh, of which uh, our bishop, um, our pastor, spiritual father is over. So I was there all week. Thank you, Simone Stewart. Um, you never know when I'm going to pop on, Diana. You are right. Uh, and so I was in Columbus, Ohio all last week. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, last Saturday, we celebrated six years of closing the gap. And for those of you who don't know, that's part of a women's ministry that I began, obviously, six years ago because we celebrated that. Last Saturday night, we were part of, my husband and I uh, hosted or emceed, however you want to choose to say it, our debutante cotillion uh, that Saturday night. And then on Sunday, we were at church doing ministry with the youth at our church. And then Sunday evening, I did a baby dedication, which is why I did not make it uh, on Sunday night. Hey, Leslie. Hey, Mr. D hey, Jimmy. Jimmy, it's time for us to see you and your beautiful wife and family. T Unfiltered, how are you doing? How are you doing? And then, um, as many of you are already pointing out, Wednesday night happened. And so uh, Wednesday night is, is, is kind of also part of the reason that I jumped on tonight. For those who don't know, if you have not, if you don't know, I am a member of the Potter's House Church of Dallas. That's where my husband is one of the associate pastors. And um, on this past Wednesday night, I was um, asked to be a part of a panel a discussion with a group of women, with dynamic women. Thank you sincerely, Chelsea. Thank you, Damien. I didn't get to see you, Damien, but I heard you were in the building. I saw a picture of you in the building. Thank you, Monique. And so I, I um, anytime, hallelujah, and hallelujah, look, I'm already saying hallelujah. Anytime um, sound bites or whatever are put out there, hey, Brother Anthony Oles, his wife was the beautiful young lady, uh, Simone, who was uh, a part of the panel as well. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all. And so I have received a lot of messages a lot of DMs, a lot of comments, a lot of um, messages from people that know me, um, that encourage me and are 
you know, giving me their feedback on Wednesday night. And I'm grateful for the opportunity. And I just kind of wanted to piggyback on a, some, a few things. I know um, I won't always be able to do this. And I know that we can't always do this. But I do want to take a few moments tonight. Um, the clip that we... He's waving in tongues. The clip that was um, played or that air that's played that's actually on my page right now. Hey, Taylor, um, about, uh, I think the question was something to the effect of about a woman being pushy or overbearing. Uh, how do you help your husband in a sense without being pushy or overbearing? And um, I had a couple of, quite a few people that DM me and sent comments uh, as it related to my to my response. Overwhelmingly, most people agreed with my response, but there were some people that just had some additional questions. And so I'm okay with additional questions. I'm okay with um, opposing even views, if you will, or wanting to come together and get an understanding. The Bible tells us, for those of you who are new, uh, even on Wednesday, I said it subtly, um, I try not to be too, so preachy, but I am a preacher. For those who don't know, I am a preacher and I am a teacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you have not, please subscribe to my YouTube channel uh, and get to know me a little better. Um, also, you can comb through some of the reels that are on my page and it will just give you a sound of my voice, who I am and what I believe and what I represent. And... So on Wednesday night, the answer that I gave, um, particularly what many of the women have been either messaging me about or having additional questions, was the comment that I made uh, about not talking to our husbands, uh, women, not talking to their husbands, their spouses in particular, uh, as treating them as if they're sons, they're, they're sons but that the love language um, the love language that men have, and the men on here can can agree and attest to this, men need to be respected. Um, that is something innately in them. And we want to be loved. We want to feel loved. And part of feeling love is secure and our safety and knowing that we are valued, that we are seen and we are heard, all of those things for women. But for men, it is actually spelled through respect. You can tell them how, that you love them. You can, um, you can do everything else that you think they desire. But if respect is not there, they are not going to feel loved. And so um, I had many women ask me the question. And I figured we'd just unpack it. And you can put your comments and we can talk. I figured we'd just unpack it. I have to also give this addendum. Hey, Eric. Hey, Brother Jose, I have to give this addendum. That statement that I was making was, first of all, in the context of marriage. Um, the second part of that is when I am saying women honor your husbands, be respectful, uh, convey your messages to them in a respectful tone. Let me let me back it up right here. And let's say that I have not always done that. I have not always mastered that. And sometimes we learn more in life by what we did not do right, sometimes more than when we think we're always doing the right thing. And so because I know firsthand that it can be ineffective or how ineffective it is uh, when, when we take a certain tone or a certain position of authority over the male in the house, uh, my comment was to to uh, prepare someone perhaps who has is not married, uh, who has not seen a model of what that should look like, and even for someone who's already married that perhaps needs to make a change and do it differently than they've been doing it or, or whatever. And so I don't come to you saying that I have always done this right. I, I like to give this addendum. What it, uh, I am a preacher. I am a teacher. It is speaking is my gift. And so anything that is your gift, you can use it for a good or you can use it for not so good. So the same way people say, praise the Lord, when I'm preaching and teaching and they are happy for the revelation, uh, I still have that same 
ability, if it is not surrendered to God, to switch that gift of giving life and giving encouragement and fighting against the enemy, I can use that in another way. I can use that to tear down. I can use that to make you feel inferior and to act condescending. I can use that same words. Be, uh, I can use my speaking gift in whichever way, whichever way. And so that's why when I spoke that on Wednesday, I believe one of the reasons that it resonated with so many people is, first of all, I believe it to be true. But second of all, it is coming from a person who has had to work out my own salvation in that area and to know that I have to submit this gift, this voice to the Lord and that I can't always use it for my for my betterment, but that I have to use it and steward it wisely. And so I had several people uh, put in the comments, hey, Marcia, hey, Elder Scruggs. I had several people put in the comments. They put it on my page uh, and they put it on my pastor's page. And I just didn't want to go back and forth or keep giving long responses on his page uh, to say, what do I do if my husband, and I'm sorry, uh, I'm not on my normal device tonight, okay, um, what do I do if my husband is not a leader, if my husband is acting like he's my child, what do I do, uh, how do I handle if my husband has not earned respect? What do I do? And so I want to address some of that. I want to give biblical context to that. And I just want to have a dialogue because I want people to know that um, sometimes there was one comment that really caught my attention uh, because the young lady said in the comments, she said, I was actually, and I'm putting it in my words, but this is what she meant. She said, I was actually getting ready to give a rebuttal, but I heard a voice tell me, no, um, just receive it, in other words. Because what happened was she automatically felt defensive. And what I have learned personally is when I am oftentimes defensive when I hear something, it is generally because there is some uh, form of truth being spoken that I'm not yet ready to either receive or I'm not yet ready to walk out. So in protection of myself or in protection of how you've been handling things and maneuvering in life, our, our humanness causes us to protect ourselves and defend ourselves and say, well, it's not me speaking uh, disrespectful to him. It is that he has not earned respect. And so I want to, to be clear. Let's be clear about some things. This, this, this conversation is in the context of marriage. This conversation is, is in the context of a man being the leader and in a position of leadership in the home. This conversation is not if you're in an abusive relationship. And I have to give these disclaimers because the enemy of our soul, the devil, will take truths and cause us to be uh, imprisoned in certain situations where actually we really need to escape. And so this conversation is not about you being submitted to a man that's beating you. It's not about you being submitted to somebody who is abusive, controlling. Uh, uh, it, it is not about that. This is not for this. So I need to put that in context because the Bible says in Proverbs 11 and 1 that a false balance is an abomination unto the Lord. A just weight is his delight. So we need to give the balance of the word of God. And so I don't want you to walk away from this live and hear me say and give you scriptures that talks about how to interact with your husband and think that it is a license or it is a, a, a sentence for you to stay with someone who is abusing you and that your life is at risk or you are not safe. That is not what this conversation is about. That this conversation is is in the confines of marriage of two people who are striving to become one. It is, it is in our nature when we get married to both try to hold on as much as we love one another. Uh, it is something about stepping into the strength of what, uh, the strength of covenant. And, I, and I, I just have to speak about, I keep hitting this. I'm sorry. I'm giving you all 
I don't know why this is happening. I'm normally on my iPad and I had challenges tonight. Um, it is something about covenant, meaning marriage between a husband and a wife, uh, because God ordained marriage in the Bible even before he ordained the church. You have to understand that the church did not come all the way into the book of Acts until the day of Pentecost was the church birth. But from the very beginning of the world, uh, the world after God met creation and after he made Adam, he said, it is not good for man to be alone. And he created Adam a suitable helpmate and her name was Eve. She was not called Eve at the very beginning. She was not called Eve until later after the fall, but he gave uh, him and help me. Hey, Bobby. And so when I am talking about uh, honoring a man or giving a man a certain amount of uh, giving a man respect when we talk to him, I am talking about that in the confines of our own marriage. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians that we are to be submissive to our own husbands. So I don't want you to think that because you are a female and someone else is a male and they are not your husband, that just because they are of a different gender, that they have authority and that you have to submit to everything that they say, because in the confines of scripture, it was appropriated for marriage. Now, of course, if you work on a job and your boss happens to be a male, then we have to uh, have to be subject to those who have authority in the workplace and not uh, not go against the grain, if you will. We have to do what we have been hired to do. But I, but this is solely in the confines of marriage. And I'm taking the time to really lay that foundation because we have new people on here who, who don't know me, who, who I don't know them. And we've, not, and we're building community here. And I want to make sure that we all hear the same thing and that we all understand the same thing. That number one, I am not speaking about a woman staying in an abusive relationship. I am not speaking about a woman being mistreated uh, at the hands of someone just for the sanctity of marriage. I am talking about two people who desire to grow together in, in marriage and who are desiring to become one. Even with the best of us, and I'm going to say with us, falling in love, loving, you know, desiring to get marriage, married, marriage is work. I don't want to say it's hard work. I just want to say it's work because maintaining any relationship is work. Maintaining a relationship with your parents is work. I'm not saying it's bad work. Sometimes we hear that word work. I know sometimes single people say, I don't want to get married because married people say it's work. Well, anything that's worth having is going to cost you something. And so if you want to attain a certain job that requires a certain amount of degrees, then you will put in the work to attain it. You will put in the work to become a doctor. You will put in the work to become a, an accountant. You will put in the work. So there is no way to escape work. You just get to choose where you work. Even if you are single, there is no way to escape working on yourself and working on your relationship with God and working on your interaction with others. Because as long as we interact with people, we will have to do some work. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. And when we come together, that, that's two people with imperfections. And now we have to work to become a cohesive unit. And this is not just for marriage. This is for any relationship. Hey, Tina, this is not just for marriage. This is for any relationship. A lot of times when I talk to the young ladies that I mentor, I assess their relationships. The ladies that I mentor that desire to get married, I assess their relationships because sometimes your, your relationships, even with your family and even with your friends, those relationships are a gauge for how you will operate in the confines of marriage. Those relationships are a gauge for how you will endure and how you will uh, have stick to itiveness, if you will, or grit or what it takes uh, to endure and to have a long lasting relationship. Some of my main concerns um, in this day and time, and Vanessa is one of my mentees, well, some of my concerns in this day and time is we are not just the cancel culture. I, 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 the cancel culture, culture, that's talking about the culture at, 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 um, 
at large, but so often I see people treat one another as if they're disposable. And if you have a track record of cutting off every relationship anytime there's any sign of either a disagreement or any time that there is, that means we have to put in a little extra work to maintain this relationship. If you automatically cut off everyone that requires additional work from you, then you are actually creating a pattern to get married and the first sign of trouble, then you will walk away. When I look at my mentees, I tell them by the time that you are 35 or so, you should be able to look back over your life and say you have had at least a friend for 10 years. You've had at least a friend for 10, 15 years that at least you were able to maintain a friendship. And if you are not in able to maintain friendships, then that's my first sign when I begin to talk up to young women about finding a husband is what is it that I need to work on that will help me be able to maintain relationships. Listen, if you cut every friendship off, you, you will not just magically get married and then you will stick to something. If it is your pattern to run, as they say in psychology, fight or flight, if you just flight or you're on the run at every sign of trouble, then you're setting yourself up to carry that into your marriage. For those of you who are just jumping on, I am jumping on tonight, responding to a couple of comments and a lot of DMs that I have received concerning my cus my comment, speaking about women uh, giving respect to their husbands and that the way men spell love is through respect. And so before we even get to that, I think we just forget sometimes that when we interact with people, it's going to require work. So when I say marriage is work, marriage is work. And it is your level of commitment that will determine if you are willing to put in the work to receive the desired outcome that you're looking for. Prayerfully, when you get married, you're getting married uh, for the rest of your life. And I know firsthand that that doesn't always happen as I shared on Wednesday briefly that I am divorced, uh, that I'm divorced. But that divorce is so long ago. I've been married to my husband uh, going on 20 years. And so... Um, I understand that things don't always last the way we desire them to, but there has to come a time that you begin to build a track record of having sustainable relationships. Sustainable relationships. Sustainable relationships. I feel the Holy Spirit on that, and that doesn't even seem like it's a preaching point. But I'm telling you, we are so accustomed now to cutting everybody off when they don't agree with us. And we're so accustomed now, uh, we, don't, we don't learn. Sometimes women, we fail to learn conflict resolution skills. And so since we don't have conflict resolution skills, the only alternative then is to sever the relationship. And when I look at the model that Jesus um, left for us, you know, so many times we say we talk about Jesus in, in preaching and healing the sick and raising the dead. But look at his day to day life. Jesus handpicked 12 disciples, one of whom he knew he chose them knowing this one is going to doubt me. This one is going to deny me and this one is going to betray me. And Jesus did not cut any of them off. He walked with them, listen to this, until the only one at the end, Judas eventually walked away from him. And so I'm not saying there aren't some toxic people that you perhaps don't need to be connected with, but sometimes we don't need to sever the relationship uh, completely. We just need to rearrange it. We just don't need to give people particular access. We need to reposition the relationship. And so when someone continues to cross a boundary, perhaps I don't, uh, I don't position them or give them the opportunity to, to cross that boundary because I reposition them rather than always seeking to sever the ties and break the relationship. So let's get to this topic.
the comment that many women sent me, and I said it earlier, what do I do if my husband is not exhibiting leadership skills, if he's acting like he's my son, what, what am I supposed to do? Because respect is earned. And so in other words, what I hear is, I am not going to respect him unless he fulfills his responsibilities. Let's go to the scripture. Before we talk this out, let's go to the book of Ephesians chapter five. And I'm going to read the Bible. For those of you who are new to Elder Dobbins, I believe that the Bible is the immutable, infallible word of God. I believe that the Bible supersedes my opinion, your opinion. I believe that the Bible supersedes culture. And so when I, when I make and formulate my opinions, I go to the Bible to give me a barometer. Listen, the Bible says it this way in, uh, in the book of Isaiah. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Marriage was created by God. So if marriage was created by God, then God knows what it takes for what he created to work. I'm going to say that again. Marriage was created by God. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Marriage was created by God. And if God created marriage, then God knows what it takes for marriage to work. You can read all of the books you want. You can get all of the, the go to people that will just align with you and your opinion. But if God created marriage and he did, then he knows what it takes to make marriage work. It's much like your car. When you buy a car, when you buy a new car, particularly a particular kind of car, let's just say you buy a Mercedes. You do not take the Mercedes to the BMW dealership. You take the Mercedes back to the manufacturer because you know that those technicians are skilled in fixing and correcting the problems that will arise in the Mercedes. You don't take the Mercedes to the, toy, to the Toyota dealership. You don't take the Mercedes to the Chevrolet dealership. You take it back to the manufacturer. God is the manufacturer of marriage. God is the manufacturer of marriage. Marriage began in the Garden of Eden when God created Adam and then God created Eve. And that was the first marriage. Everything Adam and Eve needed was already provided to them. When Eve showed up, Adam already had a place for them to live. They were living in the garden. The garden was fully supplied. It had four rivers coming in and out that sustained the garden and would help it replenish and grow and be fruitful and multiply. Everything that Adam needed to provide for his wife was already in the garden. And that was part of the travesty of them disobeying God and eating of the tree in the midst of of the garden is because not only did it cause them to be separated from God, now Adam had to work for that which God had already just provided. Now, Adam has to go and work for a place for his wife. He has to go and work to provide food for his wife. He has to go and provide for his wife. It is in the garden after the fall that God says, and you'll have to go back to the book of Genesis. I don't, I can't, I can't go through all of that tonight because then we'll end up with a two hour live as we do sometimes, but I don't want to have a two hour live tonight. And part of the curse that was given, and let's not, let's not say curse, the consequences of Eve's sins or of Eve eating of the, of the tree in the midst of the garden, the Bible says is now her desires shall be to her husband. So Adam's consequences was now he had to work and pro to provide for Eve the very thing God had already just given him. The very thing that was all there when he was formed and made from the dust of the ground, it was all there at his disposal. Now he is separated from that and he has to work for it. Now Eve's desire is to her husband. All of this was a result of their disobedience. 
Let's go to the book of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. For those that are coming on, I am responding to the many DMs that I have received and comments that have said, what do I do if my husband is not a leader, is basically is not leading, he's acting like a kid, how do I show him respect if he's really not earning this respect? I'm going to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. I know we don't like these words. And let me, let me, let me find another translation that might help y'all a little bit. But it's the same. I'm starting in Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to go back to the King James Version. And I'm beginning at verse 21. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So let's just start right there. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Verse 22, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. That's, that's key right there. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and is the savior for the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. I want you to hear this next part. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished it and cherished it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and the two shall be one. And the two shall be one. I want you to listen, read this scripture when you get your own, read it in your own time. I'm going to read it to you in a different translation so we'll understand fully what it means. I understand when women hear that word submission, we take a pause because oftentimes it's been presented to us in error. Oftentimes, we have heard people say, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. And some women feel that they have never heard uh, the man be challenged. But if you listen clearly in scripture here, and this is Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible is telling the man to love your wife. First, he says, as you love yourself. Let's just stop right there. Perhaps. That could be um, some of the issues that some people are having because if you, if, if, if you join with someone who does not fully love themselves, they can only love you as much as they love themselves. The same way you can't love anybody else any more than you love yourself. That's why the scripture that says uh, that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves Oftentimes we mistreat others because it is really a picture of how we feel about ourselves. So when a man perhaps is physically abusive, oftentimes that is a picture of how he feels internally. But the woman is just receiving uh, the brunt of it on the outside externally because he is loving her as he loves himself. That's why I started off saying uh, my statement is not for the woman that is in an abusive relationship. Uh, God does not need you uh, to sacrifice your life to the point that you are not safe in order to maintain a relationship. Jesus has already been the ultimate sacrifice. Jesus has already paid a price. Jesus died 
so that you don't have to die at the hands of somebody that says they love you. You don't, that's not what is required of you. And that's not what we're talking about here. So the Bible tells the husband to love the wife as yourself and love the wife as Christ loved the church who gave himself for it. And I started off talking about the man because so many women said, well, they weren't talking about the men last night. But in context of what we talked about, we were talking to women. The audience on Wednesday, we were talking or speaking woman to woman. We were speaking as women giving uh, our knowledge, our experience, our wisdom to other women. And I want us to sometimes take a step back and wonder it, when the Lord is speaking, and I, you have to understand, when people are speaking, it is not them speaking. You have to understand God is sending a message throughout the earth. And if, if our first inclination is to become defensive, it is an indicator that perhaps this is something we need to work on. That's not just for you. That applied to me first. As I said before, I have not always spoken... Uh, in a manner that was not disrespectful. Have I ever disrespected my husband with my words? Yes. Have I ever had to apologize? Yes. And so when I speak and say that respect is a man's love language, I'm not speaking just from knowledge. I'm speaking from experience to understand that even though you may say, I'm not going to give him respect. I'm not going to talk to him a certain way because he doesn't earn it. It does not negate the fact that he still needs what he needs. And what I really did by reading this scripture of saying that the husband is supposed to love the wife and the wife is supposed to respect and reverence her husband, I, I really wanted to read the scripture to say we don't get to choose to treat our spouses how we desire when God has already given us his word to tell us how to treat them. God, God has already given his word to say, if you want this union to work, then husband, love your wives as Christ loves the church who gave himself and died for the church. You're giving up all to love her. You're covering her the way Christ covered the church. You are dying for her. And wife, if you want this union to work, then the way it's going to work if you is if you reverence and you respect your husband because that is how I wired him. God wired him that way. And we don't get to choose whether or not they earn it or not. We don't get to say, I'm going to respect you if. I'm going to talk to you in a softer tone if. I'm not going to be condescending if. And maybe let me just testify because perhaps none of you have ever mishandled your words. I'm not going to, let's just use some, some language we can relate to. I'm not going to go off anymore if you get it together. I'm not going to come tell you what to do if I see that you have done that all of these things are saying really that you don't trust God. It's what it's saying. It's, it's all rooted in fear. It's rooted in fear that the Lord is not going to um, lead him into the plain path. It's rooted in fear that, that Lord, my husband is not going to make the best decision for this house. So let me tell him what to do. It's rooted in fear. Lord, I don't want my kids to go through what I went through growing up. And so if my husband just do it a different way or this way, then let me tell him what to do. Or let me jump in and make sure that he does it this way, because that will prevent my children from going through what I went through as a child. Fear. It's rooted in fear that I'm not going to be protected. So I don't want to just say it, oh, like, like, oh, you just have a nasty attitude. You just have a bad attitude. No, it's rooted in the fear that my needs are not going to be met. And so when that fear arises, we have to be cognizant that it's here and we have to go to God with that fear. When that fear arises that, that we don't want, listen, People mature on different levels. So I'm not even going to tell you that perhaps you may not be more knowledgeable than your spouse or perhaps you may not have achieved more than your spouse. But none of those variables have anything to do 
with whether or not you show respect. None of those have anything to do with whether or not he's the head of the house. He's the head of the house because the manufacturer, the one who created marriage, God himself, the same one who created this universe, the world in which we live, the manufacturer and creator of marriage said man is the head of the house. Manda, we want him to walk it out, but whether he has fully realized his full potential or not, doesn't mean that God doesn't still see him in that position. It doesn't mean that God doesn't still see him as the head. And what this really is, is an opportunity to grow your relationship with God in the area where you area or areas where you think you're uncovered, even though you have a spouse. To say, Lord, I'm giving you this marriage. Lord, I'm giving you my husband. Lord, I'm giving you this situation. Lord, you know we should have we should not have spent that amount of money or Lord, we should not have done this or that. But it is it is a training ground for you to enhance or grow in your relationship with God. It's not what we want to hear. It doesn't feel good. I can tell you that I've been through all of those stages, all of those phases. It doesn't feel good. But once you grow in a level, uh, once you grow in God, once you mature in God, I'm not saying that I've attained some great thing, you begin to understand that God really is in control. You begin to really know that God knows more than you do. And you begin to really accept that sometimes God uses our marriages to mature us both. It's not what we always want to hear, but actually that's the work that we have to do. It's something else I said that I don't know if anybody caught. It was when the question was asked about um, when we were talking about sex. And I know the church doesn't really talk about sex, so I'm not really going to delve into that this much. But I want you to understand something. The reason I'm talking about you spiritually with God is because you and your spouse will never become one spirit. You will become one flesh. It is the becoming of one flesh, the coming together in the sanctity of the bedroom that the scripture is talking about the one flesh. It is a becoming one flesh. You do not become one flesh overnight. You do not become one uh, flesh uh, even in a, in a year or two. It is a growing together. It is, it is really, I say it this way, the best marriages are two dead people. I don't mean two people who are dead in a cemetery. Two people who have died to their agenda and to their will and to their desires for the overall betterment of the union. Two people that said, you know what, I'm going to prefer my, my, my spouse over myself today. Two people that said, I'm going to, today, I'm going to temper my mouth. And see, the thing is, the real thing is, the reason I took this back to your relationship with God, because you can't do these things that I'm talking about without God. My mouth is, is quick. The same way people said they enjoyed me sitting on, on, a, on the plat, on the stage on Wednesday. And those questions were not we didn't have those questions in advance. They were just coming off the cuff. The same way I could respond in real time is the same way if you make me mad, I can respond in real time. So the only way to get control of that part is through the Holy Spirit. The only way to temper my mouth or temper my tongue is the Holy Spirit. It is not with someone else's changed behavior. It is not with their changed behavior because if God is trying to, to kill something in you, whether it be through this situation or another situation, he is going to allow whatever testing to come so that it will prune you and purge you to get you to where he wants you to be. 
Let me make that make sense because we don't have all church people. If God is trying to get me to manage my mouth, I'm going to just say it like that. Whether it's with your spouse or whether it's on your job, whether it's somebody driving down the street with road rage, whether it's anywhere, you will be tested in order to grow and develop temperance in that area that you can steward what you say better and properly. So this is not really about whether or not your husband um, is a good leader, whether or not your husband has good decision-making skills. Unfortunately, if you are already married, that is, a, that is something that I would suggest you go to counseling. If, if those issues are, are, are continuous or if they are of what seems to be mammoth proportions, meaning out of control, I would suggest counseling. But if you are not married, I strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you not to marry a man you do not respect. Because whether you like it or not, men spell love with respect. Whether you think they earned it or not, whether you think they deserve it or not. See, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, and let me look that scripture up so I can tell you exactly where it is. Um, I know it, but I want to give you the chapter and verse. It is the book of Proverbs chapter 14, verse 1. And I'm going to just read it in the NIV. I'm reading the New Living Translation. A wise woman builds her home, but a foolish woman tears it down with her own hands. I just want you to hear that. A wise woman builds her house, but a foolish woman tears it down with her her own hands. We've all heard the saying that says the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. So if you go off on him, if you, if you, if you, if you, you know, tell him what you know, or make him feel less than or belittle him, and you continue to do that and see that it is not getting you toward the expected end, when do you decide to do it another way? The Bible said, for those who just came on, Ephesians chapter 5, you can just read it. But the Bible says husbands are to love their wives. Wives are to respect their husbands. I know in this society that we live in, we, don't, we call these ideals, I-D-E-A-L-S, we call these traditional they are not traditional, they are biblical. So let's remove the word traditional and they are biblical. God knows how women are wired. God knows how men are wired. And he understands that men needs respect and that women need love. Somebody said, what do you think about divorce? Um, God hates divorce, but he does allow divorce due to the hardness of the heart. And that's kind of all I'll say about that. Um, but we understand that in God's eyesight, thank you, Holy Spirit. I started saying something earlier that I didn't complete. And I wanted to talk about the strength of covenant. And we don't understand covenant as much in this Western world. We understand contracts. We understand that if you sign a contract and I sign a contract, that we're bound to this contract. And if that either one of us forfeit our responsibilities of that contract, that we could go to a court of law because you had a breach of contract. We don't understand covenant because covenant is, is, a, is, a, is a biblical principle. And because it's a biblical principle and because covenant, covenant is actually stronger than a contract, it's greater than a contract. Let me, let me just see and give you a basic um, definition of co covenant. The basic definition of covenant is a binding agreement. A binding agreement. So the Bible also says 
It is better to not make a vow than to make a vow and not keep it. So for the person that's talking about divorce, you have to understand if you break a vow, that is something that you go to the Lord in repentance about because anything that we do that's contrary to his will or contrary to his word is sin. The Bible also tells us that all disobedience is sin, which means anything that we do that disobeys the word of God is automatically considered sin. So even something like breaking my vows, a binding agreement, and sometimes that vow is not just in the context and confines of marriage. It's not limited to that. It could be a vow that you made or an agreement that you made for business. It could be a verbal agreement. It could be something that someone thought this is binding and now you have broken that vow, then that requires repentance on our heart part because we have slipped into disobedience, which falls under the category of sin. Falls under <coughs> the category of sin. But I wanted to talk about covenant and how the enemy hates covenant. The enemy hates marriage. So anytime any couple or any two have come together to join in holy matrimony, the enemy is going to try everything he can to separate and divide. Marriage on this earth was made to look like a picture of the church and God, and and Jesus and and that's why we are the bride we are the bride of Christ that's why the scripture said in Ephesians chapter 5 that Jesus was the head of the church and that's how the husband is the head it is parallel because we are a picture here of what really will happen at the end the church the body of Christ being the bride of Christ and the enemy wants to do everything he can to contaminate the model or contam contaminate the entity and sanctity of marriage that was created and formed by God. I'm not trying to be real preachy tonight. I really just came on because I had so many DMs to, uh, from the ladies about, you know, some being frustrated that they don't feel like their husband is really leading the household properly. And I understand what that frustration feels like. So I want you to understand that even though the scripture is clear that we have to respect them, I don't want to minimize or I don't want to, um, to, to ignore your feelings of frustration. I don't want to ignore that you feel like you're carrying more weight. But what I do want to do is challenge you to go to God and begin to cast your cares on him. The Bible says, cast your cares on me because I care for you. Well, that word cast means to throw. And you're going to have to throw your cares on God. God, this marriage is not working. God, I don't understand the decisions that my husband has made. Whatever it is that is weighing you down, uh, rather than taking it out on him, take it to God. I'm going to say that again. Rather than taking it out on him, take it to God. God, this didn't, this didn't end up uh, like I thought it would. God, I thought we'd be further along. God, I thought all of those things, all of those broken expectations over time really begin to wound the heart and wound the soul. And it is all of those compounded that can make even the slightest little thing seem like a mountain because now it is compounded over time. And if you don't have a practice of giving God the disappointments, if you don't have a practice of giving God the heartaches, if you don't have a practice, again, I'm not talking about abuse. I, I, I mean, Lord, I, I don't know why, this, why my husband can't keep a job. Those are things that I'm talking about. I don't know why every time he gets paid, then it looks like he spent the money. It looks like the money is not going where it is. He needs to let me handle the money because I'm better with money. Lord, those are things 
you're going to have to take to, to the Lord. Lord, open his eyes and allow him to see. But not just open his eyes and allow him to see. God, help him to be a better steward. God, I, I'm praying and I'm partnering with you, God, that your will will be done in this earth as it is in heaven as it pertains my spouse. Do not be guilty of talking about your spouse more than you have prayed about them. I'm going to say that again because I don't know if I'm going to get any amens. Do not be guilty of venting or talking about your spouse negatively more than you have gone before the throne of God to pray for him or her. Because there could be some men on here that have some frustrations with women. I'm just responding to the questions that were sent to me. But it, it, it could be that there are some men on here. And if you have talked about it more than you have prayed about it, you have now contributed to the problem. You have now magnified the problem instead of magnifying the Lord. You have now... Uh, uh, you're just speaking life to the problem and you're causing the problem to grow rather than humbling yourself and going to God and trusting him even when you're fearful to know that he not only has an expected end for you, he has an expected end for your spouse and he has an expected end for your union. That God is not trying to kill you. God is not trying to uh, belittle you in any means, but God knows Listen, let me let me say this. Let me just clear this up since we're talking about marriage here. Let me just clear this up. You don't you don't you don't get let me just clear this up. You don't get to get married and then start using all of these Christian sayings that are not scriptural. Oh, I didn't marry the one that God chose for me to marry. No, God allowed you to choose. He allowed you to choose. And sometimes, rather than owning your choice, you get frustrated and blame the person rather than saying, I chose knowing we were going to have this struggle. I chose knowing or even feeling like I could help him and I'm, I'm going to help him. I'm going to develop him. I'm going to. I, I'm going to get him to do this. I'm going to help him do all, all of these things that we do in our mind. Sometimes we have all these things that we think that are going to get better if we can just get them to the altar. If we can just get them to the altar and get married, we're going to fix it all after marriage. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Because as much as you know before marriage... The scales completely fall off your eyes when you step into holy matrimony. I tell this joke. I'm glad I've been married long enough so I can say this now. But I tell this, it's, it's a joke, but it's not a joke because it's the truth. I said I did not know that I had not been delivered from cussing until I got married again the second time. I, I didn't know until the right amount of pressure had been applied that I could go off and I could cuss everybody out, still saved, speaking in tongues and preaching and teaching. I did not know until the right amount of pressure had been applied. And sometimes we think we have been delivered from something or that we are free from something when it has simply gone into remission. And you have not crossed the right trigger that will really show you what is on the inside of you. How are you doing, Frank? How are you doing? You, it's not until you get into the, the right circumstance and the right amount of pressure is applied that you really realize, oh, I still have a problem. So listen, if you're still in the, in the point that you think only he has a problem, then, then we've, we've not grown yet. We've not grown yet. One thing I'm grateful for, and I keep hitting this camera. I'm sorry, y'all. One thing I'm grateful for is I have never been surrounded by people who have not told me when I was wrong too. I've never had, I didn't grow up with, with aunts who just would sit there and lie to me. They would be blatantly honest to say, no, honey, you need to be quiet. 
My, my husband laughed. This was years ago. He said, you know, when your Aunt Janice tell you to be quiet, you're, you, 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 you be quiet faster than when I ask you to stop. When I say, Christy, stop, you keep going. You go again and you go about five more minutes. You go about 10 more minutes. But when Aunt Janice says that's enough, you just stop. I can't say, oh, he made me do it. I have to understand that's something that God is trying to work out of me. And if you know my Aunt Janice, you'll know why I stopped <laughs> when she said stop. Even to this day, when she said stop. And so I, I didn't want all of the ladies that DM me that, that didn't, you know, really fully understand why they have to respect their husbands if their husbands haven't earned it. And one lady said, respect is mutual. And I'm not saying in any shape or form that uh, someone should be disrespectful towards you. But innately, our need is to feel loved. And innately, a man's need is for respect. And so, as hard as it is, we have to sometimes go back to God and repent and say, Lord, I heard the Holy. And maybe this is just my testimony, but hopefully my testimony will help somebody. Lord, I repent. I heard the Holy Ghost say, be quiet. And I kept talking. Listen to this. I heard the Holy Ghost said, don't bring that up right now. Do not bring that situation up right now. It's not the right time. But because, but because I brought it up in the wrong time. And because God already knew, see, the Holy Spirit knows all things. That's why this goes back to our relationship. Because the Holy Spirit knows all things, he knows what's going on with me and he knows what's going on with my husband. He doesn't have to tell me what's going on with my husband, but he knew perhaps that my husband had a rough day at work that day and that wasn't the time. And so he simply told me, be quiet because he doesn't have to tell me why. Just be quiet, not right now. But because I overrode the Holy Spirit and did it my way, there was an argument or a disagreement. And now, now we're both hurt and wounded because now when my words cut, it makes somebody else get defensive. And now they feel like they need to defend themselves. And now we're having a war of words. And you look up. The problem with that war of words is... It is listen, if I, if you, if, um, if a person, and I don't want to use this example because I don't want to give any excuse for abuse, but I'll say this. If, if you fall and you, you scrape your knee, you know, when your knee healed, you can look down and physically tell when your knee healed. You don't know when the heart heals. You don't know when the soul heals. You don't know when the mind heals. You don't know how long it's going to take for those words to be erased. You don't know how long it's going to take for those words to be gone and that the residue of those words to be gone. You don't know. And sometimes you win the argument, but it costs you the battle. You have to understand the battle is not the argument. The battle is to maintain this union that we've stepped into. The battle is to maintain what, what we went before God and said that I, I am vowing before God and before man. That's what the overall battle is. The battle is for the children. The enemy is attacking through the children and we can't get on one accord. And now because we're not on one accord, we have left a door open and we don't know where the attack came from that came from our, that came toward our children, but we don't realize we have opened the door by how we have handled one another as spouses. So the question is, what if he has a different religion and his teaching is wrong and he wants me to follow him? So I, I don't really, I don't know fully what you mean by follow him. I don't know if that means uh, go to church with him or go wherever and practice. Um, 
But that is something that you will have to really sincerely take before the Lord. If you are a Christian, and so I'm supposing and I'm assuming that because you're on my live, you are a Christian and you believe in God and you believe that Jesus died for your sins and that you believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. If you are a Christian, the Bible talks to us about um, the sanctified wife or the saved wife uh, saving the husband. And the way that you win your spouse is through your lifestyle. or com the, the King James says conversation, but what that really means is your lifestyle. It means that you will have to draw him by love, that he will have to see the light of God shining through you to the point that it causes him to want to be saved. It can't be that you constantly say, I, I, I don't, uh, you constantly berate him because he believes a different way. It can't be that you're constantly telling him how he believes this in error or that it's wrong. You're really going to win him by your lifestyle. You're really going to win him if you really uh, have the love of Jesus or if your way is really the right, right way, then when you walk that way out, meaning the way of Jesus, the way of Christianity, when you walk it out, it is powerful enough to draw him. It's powerful enough. And so that prayer that you pray for him may be private prayers. You don't have to pray. You have to use wisdom. You don't have to pray. I'm a person. My husband is saved. We're both in ministry. So, you know, my children know when I pray, I could wake the whole house up praying in the middle of the night. But you can't pray that way. You have to use wisdom because the Bible says he that wins souls is wise. And right now, the soul you're trying to win is the soul that you are joined to. I hope that helps. I don't know if we have any more questions. And I'm sorry, y'all. I have hit this stand. I don't know how many times. I'm normally on my iPad. That is more stationary. And I look frozen on my end. If I'm still here, you can still hear me. Type it in the comments. Yeah, I look stuck. Okay, you're welcome. You're welcome. Well, I am happy to see all of you that have joined us and all of you that are new to Christy Dobbins. Um, this is a place where we are transparent. This is a place where we believe in the word of God. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in transparency. We believe, um, we believe, um, we just believe in loving God's people. I, I truly believe that how you love people is really an indicator of how you love God. The Bible says, how can you love God who have you have not seen and you do you hate your brother whom you have seen. And so that's why it was important for me to give a little clarity and a little context because I had so many women that were reaching out uh, who are in the middle of the frustration and the middle of the fight. And I'm telling you something, anything worth having, uh, generally you have to fight for. And each marriage has something that they have had to overcome. I don't want you to look all on these social media streets and think that every marriage is perfect. And all of these couples that we call power couples, uh, that those people have no issues and, oh, well, well, they don't have a money issue. So they have no issue or whatever the thing may be. Each, each marriage has something that has tested it so that it will be fortified and built from the inside out. Every marriage has something that they have we have had to lay down our own agenda and pick up a greater agenda. Uh, every marriage has something. And so I don't want you to feel alone because that's where the enemy overwhelms us. They think that he makes us feel like we're in a fight that has never been fought before. But I want you to know the Bible says there is nothing new under the sun. And this is why I say it is always it is always critical to have older women in your life. I, I'm telling you, my mentor um, and I posted a picture of my mentor last weekend. My mentor came in my life at a critical season. God sent her for my marriage. I preaching, 
I have been raised to preach. I have been trained to preach from a child. It, it, it was almost by osmosis. My mother was a preacher. My Aunt Janice, my Aunt Janice, who is Pastor Janice, is a preacher. My Aunt Ruth is, was an apostle and traveled the world, was a preacher and a teacher. My Aunt Nell was a pastor and a preacher and a teacher. My Aunt Nita was a prayer warrior, an anointed prayer warrior. My Aunt Faileen was an anointed prayer warrior. Even my uncles but but were preachers. But so preaching and teaching, I didn't I I'm not saying I don't need a mentor for that, but I had been mentored and I had been shaped in that already. But in this business of life and having a healthy marriage, I needed an older woman to put me in check. I'm just telling my testimony. So that I wouldn't operate in that fight or flight and say, you know what, this ain't worth it. Because sometimes once you've done something once, it's easier to do it again. So I've been divorced. And so your mind will say, or the enemy will say, you know what? I've been divorced and started over. I'll do this again because I'm not doing this. And he sent a voice that I listened to. That's the other part. It wasn't enough to send a voice if I wasn't going to listen. It wasn't enough to send somebody if I still was going to do it my way. It wasn't enough for him to send somebody if I wasn't going to recognize that it was actually God that sent her. And because God sent her, I listened. And she said it nicely and sweet. You can't leave. Baby, you can't go nowhere. So we're going to have to talk this out. We're going to have to work this out. Whether you have to go to counseling, whatever it is. But this is not the will of God for your life to walk away from another marriage. And I don't know who needs to hear that. But sometimes what we desire is not in alignment with what God willed, what he desired for your life. That's why when the Bible says he will give you the desires of your heart, that doesn't mean that whatever you desire, God is going to give you. That means God is going to put his desire in you and he's going to put his desire in you until his desire becomes your desire. He's going to give you the desire. He's going to give you the desire to serve him. He's going to give you the desire to be obedient to him. He's going to give you the desire to stay in that marriage and make it work. He's going to give you the desire He's going to give it to you. Hallelujah. I think we're going to close tonight because if I don't, I feel the shift coming. For those that are new, we can go on and we can hit a whole nother topic. But I really don't want to do that um, tonight. I just really wanted to take time to let the people know they reached out through, whether it was through DMs, whether it was through um just the comments that I heard you, that I understand where you are. I understand that you feel uh, like you're frustrated or stuck in between, but I want you to know that God will never leave you nor forsake you and that he is with you. And I want you to lean into the power of prayer like never before. You don't have to have great swelling words. You just have to talk to God. Talk to God. Tell him, tell him. The old folks had a song that said, tell him all about your troubles. But I don't even want you to just tell him all about your troubles. I want you to wait and I want you to ask God to give you, give you an answer, give you wisdom. The Bible says, thank you, Holy Spirit, in the book of James, that if any man lacks wisdom, that God will give it to us liberally. And so if you need wisdom of how to stand, wisdom of how to navigate, wisdom on how to be a steward of your words in your home, God will give it to you. Hallelujah. I don't see any more questions. Uh, don't know if anyone else had any more relationship questions before we log off. I do not think I will be on Sunday night check-in. On Sunday, for those of you who are new, I normally do Sunday night check-ins. Most of those, I missed this past Sunday. Most of those are posted on my YouTube. If you are new, I ask that you please subscribe to my YouTube channel. That doesn't cost you anything. But I ask you also to scroll through. And I know some of them are, some of them are just preaching. Some of them may be alive like this. 
Uh, just scroll through them. Some of them are long, I know, because sometimes we can get on Sunday night check-in and it'll be two hours, but just um, just calm through the page and listen to several things and allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. And I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you are part of this community that we have here. And I want you to know that I pray for people that come on. I pray for, thank you, Jasmine. She put the, the YouTube, it's just Christy Dobbins. Uh, also, the link is in my bio. If you did not listen to Wednesday night Bible study, uh, the Bible study that I was a part of on this past Wednesday, and even if you listen, sometimes when you go back and listen a second time, you get something that you didn't hear the first time. That link is in my bio too. And uh, I really would like you to go back and listen to it. Um, but I'm glad to be here, glad to serve you, uh, and, and glad just uh, that God has joined us in this season and time. Listen, it's a lot getting ready uh, to happen in this world. And I want to do my part to help prepare you for the things that are to come, the things you will get prayer here, you will get preaching, you will get teaching, you will get prophecy. This is the seventh month. This is the first day of the seventh month. And I believe that God is getting ready to complete some things. Um, somebody, uh, Damien says, sit a spell and dig into the meat of those long ones. Uh, treat yourself. Don't cheat yourself. Thank you. Um, I, I just know that there are some great and mighty things happening that are getting ready to come for the people of God. And we may be in a famine or we may be in what the world calls a reception, what the, what the, what the kingdom calls a famine. But I'm telling you, God is getting ready to show himself strong and mighty for those that call upon the name of the Lord. And I'm just glad, uh, as the old folks say, to be in the number. I'm glad that God chose us to be alive for such a time as this. I'm praying for you. I ask that you pray for me. And um, that's all I have tonight. Thank you, Loretta. God bless you all. Love you much. And have a good weekend. See you soon.